Thank you for such a nice, warm welcome. It's wonderful to be um, at this campus on such a beautiful day. We're so spoiled in the Bay Area. Um, so again, my name is Kate Leahy, and I'm a San Francisco-based uh, cookbook author and food writer. Desmond, I think what's one of the great stories is how you ended up owning a restaurant called Burma Superstar <laughs> to begin with. Well, uh, I, I didn't name the name. The, I didn't name the restaurant Burma Superstar. I purchased it from a, a gentleman. Um, who operated Burma Superstar. It was a, a failing Burmese restaurant. It just happens that one day I, I was eating there on Saturday afternoon about at one o'clock. And um, I, I real, someone walked in and uh, he was a little bit hysterical and then just found out that uh, Burma Superstar was sold. And I'm thinking, shit, what am I gonna eat now? <laughs> And in, in those days, there were no Burmese restaurants. Uh, there was um, Burma Superstar, and there was Mandalay, and I can't think of another one in uh, Philadelphia, one in D.C., two in New York, and that, that was it. And uh, no one knew Burma, no one knew Burma Superstar, Burmese food, or anything. So make the long story short, <laughs> I was just thinking, okay, better, you know, like, um, I, I, I wanted to know what's going to happen to the restaurant. Uh, I got the uh, owner's phone number and uh, to see if uh, he might be interested in uh, selling it to me so that I could keep it as a Burmese restaurant. Um, it was sold to a Chinese uh, gentleman. I think he was going to turn that into a Chinese restaurant. So uh, my conversation with him was, uh, can you back out of the, the deal so I, I could pay you maybe a little bit more, 10, 15 percent. And uh, what he said was, okay, you know, hang on, uh, let me see what I can do. So um, uh, the next day, I went there on Saturday, Sunday, he called me back about at 10, 10 p.m. when I was in my office. And uh, he said, uh, hey, you know, there might be a way where I could get out of the deal. And um, come and take a look at it. So I made arrangements to go look at the restaurant on Monday. And, um, you know, if you're looking at a hole in the wall place, that was it. I mean, that was written hole in the wall. Well, because one of the things was at that time, Clement Street, that part of Clement Street was really quiet. No one yeah. went on to that part of Clement Street to go out to eat, right? right? There was well, just, uh, it was just the quiet side of the It was, it was of quiet the side. There were cafes, and, and I think there were, you know, young kids that hangs out, you know, after school. Um, yeah, I, I would say <clears throat> Clement Street was a uh, second Chinatown. And um, it, it wasn't a busy space. Um, I simply just wanted a Burmese restaurant to stay Burmese and, uh, and eat Burmese food with my family and friends. So I went, to, I went there on, a, on, on Monday, took it, looked at it, and uh, thought about it, and uh, called them back on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, you know, we have a restaurant. So it was funny. Pretty quick. That all happened within... I think like four days. And that was in 2000, and the restaurant was yeah, originally opened in 1992, so it had been right. operating. Seven years. But yeah, so, so but, because you grew up in, well, part of your growing up was in the inner Richmond neighborhood in San right. Francisco, but the other part was in Yangon. In, right? in Yangon, yeah. right. Yeah, the, I mean, also growing up, because there, there were no Burmese, rest, Burmese food, the only Burmese food that, you know, I would get would be from my, my mom's. And, um, you know, and I, I didn't cook, and I, you know, I, I, I don't cook. And my mom would ask me, uh, what will you eat when I die? So, <laughs> and now we have six restaurants. She doesn't ask me that question anymore. <laughs> so, That's true. Right, because uh, when you were growing up, um, before you came to the U.S., um, it was all the girls who would learn how to cook in the kitchen, and the right. boys were off the hook. So right. you just learned how to be a really good eater. Right? Uh, a good was, cleaner. Yeah, and a good, good cleaner. And good yeah. cleaner, right. I learned about food just basically from eating, eating a lot of it and uh, just understanding the flavors, so. What are the kind of the, for you, what are the most nostalgic flavors about Burmese food? The kind of things when you smell it or you taste it or you, you, know, you just think that, that really reminds me of, of your childhood. Um, it'll, it'll be the curries. Curries are a little bit different, you know, from Chinese curries, Korean curries, um, Indian curries. Uh, I, I think the, the, the closest to Burmese curry, I mean, if, if I have to, um, um, compare would be a uh, no, southern Indian curries, uh, light, a little bit lighter in flavor, masala, spicy. But the other one would be a mohinga, which is a catfish uh, stew-like type of uh, dish, um, you know, served with noodles. And uh, it's, it's a dish that you um, 
stew for a couple of hours with catfish and uh, until the catfish is broken down. You know, maybe you could yeah. uh, explain a little right. bit more yeah, about Right, yeah, well, that. what I love about the story about Mohinga is that people get, order this dish. It's sort of a sleeper on the menu. It's a quieter dish. Um, but when you go to, uh, to visit Myanmar, um, I mean, and we should probably talk a little bit about just the name, just to clarify. Uh, so when you lived in that country, it was called Burma. Burma. And, you know, you had already moved to the U.S., and then the government changed the, the name to Myanmar. So in the cookbook, when we refer to your childhood, we talk about Burma. When we refer to present, the country present day, we, talk, we say Myanmar. And one of the reasons was 2012, uh, President Obama actually called the country Myanmar. And that sort of like started a change um, in, in Western countries referring to the country um, as Myanmar. Um, but back to, back to something more fun, uh, Mohinga. Um, when you go visit Yangon, the first thing you see, like all the street vendors, it's Mohinga. That's, it's like the pho. It's like you see, it's a, it's a very popular street food. You eat it for breakfast. Now you eat it for lunch and dinner. It's become so popular. But it's really relatively unknown in the United States. And no one's really heard of Mohinga. People come in for good reason at Burma Superstar to order the tea leaf salad. But Mohinga kind of gets left aside, you know, because you don't know what it is. So when people order it, they think, oh, I'm, I'm getting catfish. And then they get it, and they go, well, wh where's, yeah, where's, where's the, the catfish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where's the beef? So how I learned how to prepare it, I, I watched um, a couple of the cooks in the, um, in the restaurants as well as um, an aunt of Desmond's. And I saw how they prepared uh, Mohinga. Um, and there's lots of ways to do it, but the key is you get a whole catfish. And that becomes the base of this, the, the, the broth, the stock that you make. And you cook that catfish, then you take the meat off, you put the bones back in, you simmer that, you strain that broth, and then you take the catfish meat um, and cook it with aromatics. And all of it gets combined, but you're kind of crushing the catfish meat. So the soup is thick and rich. You won't see the catfish, but it's definitely in there. Um, but it, it's just that it's a really rich, soul-satisfying dish of noodles, broth, catfish. Um, and in other parts of, of Myanmar, they have um, their own variation. There's local variations everywhere. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, in the cookbook, we decided it was such a you know important dish for the country um, that we included two. So you have your option of doing a, a spicier, more um, you know seafood-based. You don't have to use catfish. You could use um, a, more of a seafood uh, type of fish. I mean, we we like to. You know, the fish you get locally is so different from the fish you get in other parts of the world that you can be flexible with the fish, but the aromatics are what change from the Rakhine Mohinga. Rakhine is, um, is a state on coastal, the, yeah, yeah, coastal state. And they're cut off from the rest of the country with this wall of mountains. So they use a lot more seafood in their cooking, and their cooking is a lot spicier. So we put a lot of chilies in there. Um, we, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely broth. It's a little bit... Um, it's, it's just two different variations. And if you look at the cookbook, the back cover is the Rakhine Mohinga. And then within the cookbook, um, the picture that has the, the sort of an essay on Mohinga, that's the classic sort of Burma superstar version. That would be the version that would be inspired by uh, Yangon. Um, but it's, it's your favorite dish, it, right? It is, you know, curries, <laughs> coconut rice. Yeah. Um, and your daughter's. And, yeah, my daughter yeah. eats it. You know, it's her favorite dish also. Yeah. Um, you know, rather than what um, I think that people want to hear, are, are there any questions that well, people want well, to ask? One thing I'll ask, ask? Um, well, let's actually talk about how the recipes came to being in, right. the, in the cookbook, because I think this is something that we joke about a lot. It's just when I started working with you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, when, so when we started uh, working with Kate, um, you know, Kate would ask me, you know, can I see the recipe book? <laughs> I'd say, um, we actually don't have a recipe book. And Kate wouldn't believe that. We don't have a recipe book. And, um, and we actually don't, you know, considering that we have all these restaurants. And I, I think it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a funny situation because uh, we have a lot of people who've been with us for 10, 15, 20 years. And uh, they, they know how to do different stations, uh, do different things. And uh, we've never had any problems with... Um, having the food to be consistent because they, they've just been there for a while. They know exactly what to do. And uh, we've never had a need for it. So Kate, Kate came on, all of a sudden we have a recipe book. <laughs> right, right. So a lot of times when I start working with um, a chef on a cookbook, you know, these, these chefs have, they, they have these 
they have their recipes written down in some fashion. Some cookbooks, I mean, some chefs have them written in like a, just a notebook. And then I have to look at all their, you know, I have to figure out what their shorthand is. Like one, one chef I worked with, um, Mindy Siegel in Chicago, she's a pastry chef, and she would just write V-E-X. I was like, what's V-E-X? She's like, oh, that's a, um, that's a pure vanilla extract. It's like, <laughs> all right, so, so Vex. Now I think Vex, vanilla, all right, I'm fine. But I didn't even have that to work off of. So you know, other chefs have these you know, long spreadsheets of all the different variations you can do with the dish. And it's all measured out to the gram. Um, and for, with those kinds of recipes, what I do is I have to cut them down and make sure you can do that in a portion that serves four to six instead of you know, 20 to 50. Um, so, this part time, though, I just had to go into the restaurant and um, meet with the different cooks. And that's the one thing, though. There's not one chef of all the restaurants. There are kitchen managers and cooks. And all these cooks are cross-trained on all the stations. Um, and, and what's fascinating is all of them speak different languages. Um, even the ones who came from Myanmar speak different local you know, languages. Because the country, which is pretty fascinating, and I didn't know this coming in from the outside. Um, there's 135 uh, uh, ethnic groups in Myanmar that are officially recognized, and there's a lot more that go unrecognized. So you have a very, very diverse population. Um, I mean, so it, it's almost like an Asian melting pot. Yeah, it, yeah. Well, the, the, where it's situated, it, you know, it's interesting, because it's right between India and China. Really, it's where China meets India. You know, on one side you have a billion plus population. On the other side, you still you know have over a billion population. So they're really interesting. And just you know, from that alone, that I put aside, there are about 130 different ethnic groups, and uh, there are a lot of um, you know Indian immigration in the early 1900s because of the, the huge economic boom when the uh, English took over. You know, I, I think there were a couple of millions of uh, Indians that immigrated in the early 1900s. But also, uh, you know, Chinese immigrated around that time, a couple hundred thousand dollars. And uh, around that time, you know, the Burma was the, uh, the was the, the Yangon port was the most pro prosperous um, poor country really in that region because of uh, you know around that time a lot of people went to Burma. I mean, before Burma. World War II, the biggest uh, rice exporter in the world right. was Burma, which is just kind of crazy to even right. fathom. Yeah. Right. So, you know, the, the, the diversity with the uh, population, and just because of that, Burmese food is interesting, you know, because of the Burma borders, Thailand, India, China, Bangladesh, and so forth, you get a lot of different spices from those places. And uh, at the same time, you know, Burmese food is uniquely Burmese. Uh, the tea leaf salad, mohinga, that you can't get anywhere. But then there are a lot of dishes that, that will remind you of um, Thai food, Indian food, Chinese food. So forth. And one thing I like about the, the recipes uh, is that a lot of them are very doable at home. This is home cooking that then was remade into to fit a restaurant. So um, what we talked a lot about was how to kind of reintroduce it to home cooking. Um, and if anyone's ever looked at a, a Thai curry recipe that had, I don't know, 100 ingredients and you make this paste. and. Um, this is sort of a nice respite from that. You can make this, um, and you don't need to source a lot of um, hard-to-find ingredients. If you have onions and garlic and turmeric and paprika, you can go pretty far with this book, which um, there are the exceptions. Um, but in general, like a lot of the, the flavor profiles, um, you can find at most local grocery stores now that fish sauce is so widely available. Um, and fish yeah. sauce, shrimp paste shrimp might paste be a little stuff. harder. Yeah. Um, but it's not in every, every recipe. And I know sometimes it's kind of an acquired taste. But it really is such like shrimp paste, like the, the, the salty, um, like spicy, spicy yeah. savory flavors are really what, to me, th I think of with Burmese food. It's not, it doesn't have the sweet flavors that you might think of in Thai cooking. Yeah, I think the fish sauce are popping up everywhere yeah. nowadays You know, with yeah. the, the red boat. Uh, maybe well, Italians should, are putting fish yeah, sauce in their tomato sauce. The shrimp sauce paste now. might not, might be nice. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. just uh, you know just how much you put in it. I think um, with uh, Burmese food, it's you know people use it, and well, it's, it's very flavorful, really pungent, and um, you know I'm not sure you know people have adopted to the uh, the shrimp paste uh, flavors, but yeah. I think that a lot of people are you know they're traveling, they're tasting, they're trying. And uh, I'm, I'm seeing that at uh, local stores you know, everywhere. One so. thing I wanted to ask you about, too, is just um, let, let's talk about tea leaf salad. I mean, it's, some, it's something that Burma Superstar is known for. Um, 
it, it was, it's something that, I don't know, kind of was, you explained it, maybe a Samsonite ingredient for many years. Um, the country was closed <laughs> yeah. off, right, from the world. You couldn't legally export something from Myanmar straight to the United States. It had to go through these different right. channels. So, the, yeah. the, because Burma was a, was a sanction, sanctioned country for the last 50, 60 years, and you couldn't get anything out of Burma. So if you receive products from Burma, it might be a, a product of Thailand or Malaysia or Singapore, India, and so forth, because uh, normally it will go to those states or those countries. And from there, the country of, the, the country of origin disappears. It becomes product of Thailand, Singapore, uh, and so forth. So, um, so the, the way that we've been getting the tea leaf uh, in the past was um, whoever goes back to Burma bring back some tea leaf salad. <laughs> and they bring them back, you know, with their luggages. Samsonite ingredient. And, uh, you know, thanks to the, you know, the, 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 the tea label, uh, I, you know, I think that we've been able to just get the product without any problems. But how did you do that? But, like how did you find, how did you find the right people to be able to? It, well, it, it became a pretty lucrative business for them. You know, we, we, we own several restaurants. We, we started selling just a lot of tea leaves so in our restaurant. So tell, tell me about the, where the tea leaf is grown. The tea leaf that we were getting are, you know, are not the, the best quality. I think the, the coloring that they used to keep it green was questionable. Mm -hmm. Preservatives and you know, I love MSG, but you know, the, in those packets there were like 10, 15 percent. That was a little bit too much for me. <laughs> so, so um, and also, you know, and we wanted to give our customers a, a better product. So uh, we started looking around. Uh, 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 we started looking around and asked different people, "How do you make the tea leaf salad?" You know, what's really interesting is that um, the tea leaf salad is ubiquitous in, in Burma. Everybody, they all eat it. They eat it for snack, kids, adults. You go there, you see that everywhere. How many people have been to Burma in here? Um, oh. you see, did you, you know, see? Did you see the tea leaf salad there, or, or tea leaf in general? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> everybody eat it. It's 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 everywhere. I remember so, seeing it in the snack packs. You get yeah. the tea leaf itself, and a little pet, as they, they call it in, in, in Myanmar, the, um, the tea leaf salads in, in these little pet snack packs that you could think of like someone buying a, a pack of chips, but instead they're buying a pack of tea leaves, and they'll just throwing in um, the crunchies, the, the right. fried garlic, maybe well, some peanuts. That's your caffeine. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's your the, caffeine. So if you're a student so studying, a, a savory just caffeine. get a little like packet of tea leaf and, right. yeah. So, you know, um, we asked everybody, you know, in, in San Francisco, Burmese people, how do you ferment the tea? How do you make the tea? Nobody knows. So we went to Yungo. How do you make it? Nobody knows. It's just really strange. Everybody eat it, but they don't know how it's made. And uh, if you have any Burmese friend, ask them. I challenge you, you know, that they will know how, how it's done. So anybody from Burma here? Nobody. Okay. Um, so. Um, we ended up in the, the, the Shan State, which is a, a very conflicted area, uh, and you know one of the largest ethnic um, region in Burma. You know they, they, they want they want their independent state. The North want their own independence. The South wants their they want their own independence. It's a fairly remote jungle area, and then you have these drug warlords who wants their own area. It's part of the, the Golden right, Triangle right, region. Part of, and, the, and then the Burmese government, they are all there. There are four military groups that are always there fighting. So, it's, a, it's an interesting area to go. Interesting is a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, that's where we get our tea from. So we go up to the most northern part of Shan State, uh, a region called Nam Sam, just arguably probably where where the best tea from Burma comes from. So, you know, we, we go, we take the, the small plane to get to the certain area, and, and from there, drive another six, seven hours to this uh, mountains area, and that the, to the tea region called Nam San. The way I always think of it is Nam San, if people are, think of um, wine and terroir, and they talk about soil types, when you think of Nam San, where the tea is grown, it's a sandy type of soil that's, that drains well, that is ideal for the type of tea that you pick and then ferment. It's not the same as like for black tea. Black tea, at least in, in that part of the world, grows better in a, a soil that has more clay. So the, the type of soil makes Nam San particularly great for this type of tea. And we were looking at different samples of um, the, the tea leaves when they're dried. You could, you could tell the ones that had the brighter, uh, more of a, a yellow kind of color, gold color 
those were sort of, you, you get a higher price for that. That's supposed to higher quality. The real dark ones with really big leaves, right. those are sort of a lesser lesser yeah. quality tea leaf. Well, in, in Burma, so the quality ones you, you, you are speaking of are called, they're, they're tea buds. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're called, um, people refer to those as uh, tea, you know, tea for generals. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but uh, those are the, uh, those people are the only one who can afford it. But what's really yeah. cool is uh, for the longest time, people who were tea farmers, uh, they had a hard time. They used brokers um, in Mandalay. Mandalay is the biggest um, trading, um, agricultural trading city in the country. And uh, the tea brokers sometimes wouldn't pay the tea farmers until they had sold all the product. So you had these tea farmers, maybe they'd do a whole, uh, you know, three different, four different harvests during the year, and then they wouldn't get paid for a year. So it's no wonder that maybe picking opium became pretty, you know, a, a good option for them. Um, now you're working with a, a tea co-op, a right. newly formed tea co-op that's now giving more power to the farmers themselves, um, getting more education from the outside world now that the country's opening up. They can learn better um, like plant management techniques. At the same time, they've always been organic, which is pretty great. So they didn't have to like re, you know, take away a lot of pesticides. This, they didn't have money to pepper pesticides to begin with. Jungle tea, it was growing sort of in a wild type of way. So in a way, because they skipped a lot of this modern, like uh, modern agriculture, they actually benefit in, in the modern right. <laughs> world. It, 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 yeah. yeah, it's this, um, you know, interesting market because uh, the brokers were paying them also so little to a point where, you know, aside from these uh, crazy terms, uh, they, they were getting very little. So they were um, going to China to do farming work, abandoning their farm, which, which is uh, a little crazy, you know, to think that Chinese farmer, Chinese are paying more money than Burmese. So you can imagine, you know, how little they were getting paid. So uh, what we did was that we, we paid them, you know, whatever that we were paying the brokers, a little bit more. And, uh, and uh, also work with the farmers to organize a uh, association where we buy the, uh, the tea from and the farmers go sell their tea at that association and we buy it from there. And so that they don't have to negotiate with the, the farmer, you know, the brokers. So uh, the farmers in Burma are probably a little bit different from the farmers in the U.S. You know, they're, they're, they don't have a lot of land. They're probably micro farmers. Mostly they're micro farmers and they're, they're not wealthy. They're really poor. And uh, they're not sophisticated. So when you negotiate, you know, you just pay whatever price that the brokers are paying. And also the terms are ridiculous. As you were saying, you know, they don't get paid until it's sold. So um, can you imagine if you, you didn't know. get paid until a year after the work you did? You know, it's like, how would you how would you right. live? How would you buy food? Right. So so things are you know changing a little bit. I think that we're also introducing um, um, the organic farming to them or working towards, um, you know, um, providing soil because they're, 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 they're harvesting, but they're not taking care of their land. That also means that, you know, the, the, the yield is not that great. I think that if we introduce um, um, uh, certain farming methods, you know, I think that they, they, they can uh, yield yeah. far greater than whatever it is that they're, they're you know, they're, they're getting at the moment. So, so one of the things in, in the book, there's, um, there's, this is not about tea, but it's uh, related to that area. There's a, there's a salad. Well, we use the term salad pretty loosely. Salad can mean a lot of different things in, in Burmese cooking. But it's, um, it's a, a salad made with uh, basically shredded dried mutton. So we can use it in the States. We can use um, beef jerky. And it's just shallots and um, lime juice and some crushed garlic and some chilies and some oil. You toss it together, and it's and what we call an, yeah yeah the yeah. Um, we yeah. call it a uh, namsan salad. Didn't really have a name, but we came across it on the one rest stop on the way up the mountain to, to the tea farmers. There's this little like hole in the wall place, and it's just everyone's like oh that's just namsan restaurant. So well, we stopped there coming down yeah. or coming up the mountain and coming back down. So yeah, namsan you, restaurant is in the book in that rest, in that yeah. um, for that dish. The dish yeah. is delicious. Nobody can resist it. But every time we eat it, we everybody gets sick. No, no, we didn't. This <laughs> really? I think the first time you did. Well, that doesn't really that doesn't sell the maybe, recipe. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you didn't eat it. Well, we're not selling the no, recipe from. That's true. Uh, from that's true. Well, if you make it at home, you will not you will not get sick. That yeah. I don't know if like yeah. you know people traveling in in Myanmar. There's always like a yeah. little story. You always have to be a little bit more careful than you would. In, yeah. in other parts of the world, um, but you know we've been talking um, with everyone here, and thank you for 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 hanging out with us. But we want to also you know open up the floor to questions and see any of your burning questions um, about Burma Superstar. Hi, thanks for coming today. What is the detailed process for fermenting the tea leaves? 
Um, so, uh, you know, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think um, tea, they're picked in, um, in April, June, and um, in August. That, that, I, did, I think that's specific to Burma. Usually the uh, April picks are the best because you know it hasn't touched water and so forth. So right, because the dry season right. um, ends in August. And it begins in, yeah, it, yeah, it ends in August and then it starts the raining again in about May, June. So you know the the flavor aroma, typically they're a lot more robust. So uh, so the the uh, the buds are you know premium. The the April tea buds are premium, and then you have the the lower you know the leaves from the tea branch. And uh, so the June and then August. So what happens is that you, you pick the tea, whether you know buds or the middle layer of the branch. Uh, same day, you take it back to your house, and from there you steam the uh, the steam the, the tea leaf, you know, very high temperature, and uh, you roll it, and uh, you put it in a fiber bag. From there, uh, you bury it underground, about ten by ten by ten, you know, the, um, ten. 10 feet deep, you know, 10 wide. And uh, on top, you'll have heavy, heavy rocks to pressure the tea so that, you know, you squeeze out the water, air, and so forth. You let it sit for minimum two months up to six months. And uh, sometimes after, two years when in yeah. back and before they had a hard time selling it. Right? Yeah, they would, uh, <laughs> I haven't tasted any of that. <laughs> that would be extra sure. premium, premium, yeah, double aged. That would be right? a little bit too premium yeah. for me. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know it, it's it, it's a pretty easy process, but because it happens at a, such a remote area, um, no one really know how tea is fermented. That but basically that's it. Yeah. The, uh, the key is you have to have access to fresh tea plants, and right. when you pick them, you have to steam them right after picking before they can turn start to turn black. Right. It's uh, how they're oxidized. You know the oolong tea. So you have your green tea, black tea, and so forth. You know they're 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 oxidized. I think maybe the correct word is oxidation. Is how how long you oxidize the tea that changes the color. These teas also they're never dried. They're always just kind of kept, um, and they start releasing like a, that black tea oil, right? From right. the oil from the black the tea leaves. Well, sort I, of this supposedly the guys say it cure baldness. So I haven't oh, tried. Oh well, no, I think yeah. they also use it for hair dye. Yeah, yeah. well, hair dye yeah. and baldness there kills two birds with one stone. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> So. Uh, thanks very much for coming. I'm a very long time fan of Mandalay and Burma Superstar. Yeah, thank you, Mandalay is great. I go to Burma yeah. Love every single week now. Thank yeah. you very much for studying that as well. Um, I haven't had a chance to go to your country yet, but I was recently in Korea, and I was very surprised by the big influence that the American occupation in the early 50s uh, following the war left in their street food. So they eat lots of spam and canned beans and canned corn. So I was wondering uh, when the Japanese occupied uh, in World War II and then the British got there uh, to push them uh, out, I guess. Uh, did that also leave any uh, changes, I guess, in, in, in food culture in Burma, either from the Japanese or British side? Well, with the British side, I would think the first thing would be the, the tea houses, the tea shops that yeah. serve the dark tea with um, milk. And it's in, 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 in Burma, they would use um, condensed milk and evaporated milk. But I'm sure that's just because uh, the British probably preferred fresh milk and they just maybe didn't have access to it. But that tea is extremely popular and actually extremely um, delicious, too. Right. So you're talking a little bit about history. You know, the Brits went there in 1885, November 28, 1885, and uh, went over to Burma, uh, forced out the monarchy, and um, and um, basically abolish all the monarchy that existed uh, that existed for over. That's thousand, pretty ironic yeah, when you think about years. it. The British coming and abolishing a monarchy, yeah. you know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So Burma became a, a province of uh, India, and uh, but, but a very prosperous one because of the uh, the rich, you know, the, there was a lot of agriculture, a lot of best tea best ruby in terms of uh, natural gas. You know, right now, they're probably number three in the world. Uh, so after that, because you were talking about Japanese, um, uh, during the war, Japanese came in, invaded for three years. They got the British to kick out the Japanese again. And then from that, you know, like communism was very popular. Um, I'm not sure how much influence uh, Americans had in, in Burma or Spain. 
But from there, the, the, they, they basically uh, locked up, uh, you know, they locked themselves up and uh, separated themselves, kept themselves away from outside world. Uh, they abolished education, you know, the, um, scholarships and so forth. Um, so with the Brits, uh, um, there was a lot of influence with agriculture and processes, a system, but not, not with food. I think maybe tea. And with Japanese, as far as I'm aware of, it, it just started popping up in the last five, six years. And uh, I think, if anything, it would be Indians who came in, the, in the, between, the, say, 1890 to uh, 2010. Like I had said earlier, there, there were about two million came in. And, uh, and Chinese came in you know, about that time. So about a couple hundred thousand. So a lot of influence with uh, Chinese and Indian not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, English food or Japanese food. I'm curious, uh, what do you think the near future of Burmese food is uh, in the United States uh, in terms of how people are aware of it, how people understand it as part of their everyday experience? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll take that question. I think uh, t what I feel is, um, you know, sometimes things have to start on the West Coast and then New York has to discover it. And then once New York discovers it, they own it, sort of, and they make everyone, you know, aware of it. I think that's what happened with blue jeans, um, you know. So they're invented here, then they sent there, and then they became popular. Yeah, they, um, New York need to talk about so, it. So New York needs <laughs> uh, more Burmese America restaurants. Listen. But but on, yeah. on a more serious note, I think what's happening: the Bay Area has a very diverse um, Burmese population, um, and I think the future of Burmese food is being able to go deeper into the regions. Of, of the country and, and having maybe a restaurant that's dedicated strictly to the Shan state. Um, when you go to Yangon, there are restaurants that are specific to different parts of um, different parts of the country. And I could see that being the next step that maybe um, 10 years from now, instead of saying this is, this is a Burmese restaurant, this is a Chin restaurant, this is a Shan restaurant, this is a Yakin restaurant. Um, and that would be actually fascinating because we're just scratching the surface on, on the different differences between um, the different parts of the country. And I'm kind of excited to, to learn more about those parts of the country. Yeah, so different things are happening. If you go to Burma, you know, they're, they're more fascinated with um, Thai food or Chinese food or European food. But in, in, you know, the, they, if, you, if they have guests, they try to avoid taking you to a Burmese restaurant because they're, they're everywhere. So going back to, you know, to your question, to, um, um, it's, I, I think that, you know, the people are beginning to just discover Burmese food. And um, it, it could be anything. You know, I think that tea leaf, it's, the dressing is really flexible. I mean, I, I, I think that people were doing different things that they were, were, we or they are not doing in Burma. So right. <laughs> in, in Burma, so uh, we use the uh, fermented tea and rub it on chicken or fish and, and steam it, and it's delicious. It's something that we don't do in, in Burma. And, um, you know, in, in Burma, you know, the, because of the uh, availability of refrigerators. It's pretty questionable. In yeah, parts you know, of freshness the is, con you know, questionable. Just, you know, so you cook everything to death just to make sure that you know, they're sanitized. <laughs> so, and, um, and, you know, I think the ingredients here are, uh, you know, readily available, more fresh, so you could do things a little bit differently. Um, uh, you know, what's authentic? So that then you then you maybe uh, now we're talking about authenticity. You know, then the question is, what's authentic? I think to me, authentic is whatever your mom made at home. You know, not what you know other people are saying. Yeah, I mean, the, my aunt can make it, and it's not authentic because it's not like my mom's dish. So, you know, same with spaghetti, right? There are a lot of, you know, so many ways of doing it, what's authentic. Um, uh, uh, people are just discovering. I, I don't know the direction, I can't tell. I mean, I can only tell you to come to our restaurant, invite your friends, go eat there all the time, <laughs> and discover where that's going, <laughs> and keep coming. <laughs> so, it, it's a difficult question. I, I hate to see um, Burmese who go authentic, or go to, um, a fusion route. I think that you know. I think people are just beginning to discover uh, Burmese food. Uh, I think um, you know ethnic. You know. Okay. So an another thing. So growing up, when I came to U.S., you know, um, in the uh, early '80s, uh, you know, 
I or fellow immigrants from Southeast Asia were discriminated. Maybe the food that we ate were a little stinky. People, everybody ate sandwich and burgers. No, it's like if I bring rice to work, they'll beat me up. And um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting that now today, people want Burmese food. You know, it, it's, um, it's nice that I don't have to hide, <laughs> you know, fish sauce. You know, I could say, you don't know fish sauce? Where have you been? <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. I think there, there, we, we can do a lot, you know, moving forward. You know, it's, it's an open game. Um, you know, personally, I love, you know, Southeast Asian food or South Asian food. People are just discover, beginning to discover, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the flavors of South Asia. So, but also another thing, I think with the new generation of um, restaurateurs coming up, in the past, maybe the older generation didn't understand quality or maybe uh, aesthetics or communication or education. So uh, they didn't quite um, um, you know, meet the expectations of uh, a lot of the American audience. I think the new generations might be different. I think they understand quality. They uh, understand uh, ambiance. They, they definitely know how to uh, um, you know, communicate the, the food to, the, uh, to their customers. So I think that Chinese, Thai, Indian cuisines have, uh, are going to be interesting moving forward. One more question. So you mentioned the diversity of, of Burmese cuisine in the various provinces. You've also expanded your, your restaurant empire as well. So what's your philosophy by, by, for opening new restaurants, creating clones of Burma Superstar? Like how do you get, get each one its own identity? Well, it's kind of funny from that little hole in the wall restaurant to be referred to as a, you know, empire. <laughs> you know, we, you know we, we have a couple of restaurants. Um, One of the things that I, I learned working with you, Desmond, is that you always uh, made sure that the restaurants were their own individual entity. So if you go to the, some people's favorite location is in Alameda, and Alameda has a totally different feel from the one in Oakland, which has a de totally different feel from the one in Clement Street. And right. each of them act sort of like each staff is almost like family there. And sometimes they are family. The sisters will be servers together, brothers will work in the kitchen together. Um, and I mean, you don't have any intention of, of so yeah. maximizing Burma Superstar right. saturation in the city. Burma Love is a little bit different. It's um, a restaurant that has um, a little bit broader menu. One of the reasons. Um, the kitchen is, uh, you guys got to design that kitchen from yeah. scratch, so you could do certain things in that kitchen that you couldn't in, in the smaller Burma Superstar kitchens. Um, and so my like insider tip is go to Burma Love for the platha, which is that lovely buttery flatbread, because I think they have the best griddle. And no offense to the other yeah. restaurants, but yeah. they have like an actual, like, like they have a larger space. And the way you guys do the platha there is just perfect. So. Well, yeah, we adopt to the environment. So maybe a technology people will call cause you know like dumbasses. You have such a uh, popularity. Why don't you grow? You could have five, ten, fifteen, twenty. But um, we we really haven't really you know in the last twenty years uh, you know we uh, opened four Burmese restaurants, and uh, it wasn't because uh, we're really ambitious or you know smart. Um, you know the one the guy from Alameda sucker us into buying that restaurant. It, it was a, another Burmese restaurant called. Hinta, and uh, it wasn't doing well. So you know, I, I, we try to be as helpful as we can be. So he'll call us, hey, you know what? Uh, I'd like to come talk to you. You know, like I know your restaurant is doing really well, and uh, you know, see if I if I could pick your brain and so forth. So we started talking to this guy, and um, Nick, and um, and you know, we identify a lot of problems. You know, and um, at first, you know, it. it your floors really shouldn't be shiny, and um, and you know the the mango chicken or whatever all the Chinese dishes needs to go away. And I think people want Burmese food. You should give Burmese food. But then because his customer because his business wasn't doing well, he was a catered to whatever little customers that he had. He was uh, very unwilling to give up the chop suey that was selling, you know, to whoever that was coming in or the mango chicken. So you know, I, I think in the end, it, it takes time, you know, to um, to um, to win a little bit of you know loyalty from the customers. Maybe he was selling the wrong dishes. You know, I don't know. A lot of things were happening, um, but in the end, he didn't want to do 
And he didn't want to continue the, the business. I, I think the, maybe the path to a successful restaurant was much different than what he had thought. So you know, he asked me if I wanted to buy it. So I, you know, I said, sure, why not? So <laughs> that's how we ended up with the second restaurant. And same with the third, same with the fourth. So it wasn't because of you know, ambition. Uh, we weren't looking out for it. So uh, even tea leaf, which is based on, hey, we, need, we have bad tea leaf. You know, I think that we should make our own. And then uh, with the beer, hey, you know what? Uh, if Singaporean or Thai or Chinese have their own beer, I don't think there's a Burmese beer. So we uh, have our own Burmese beer. And, um, and uh, on Clement Street, we have three restaurants. It was purely out, out of really laziness, because uh, it's just easier to manage if they're all at the same place. You know, why do I need to go different places? You know, so um, <laughs> now you have to the, go to a lot we of bought different a places. coffee shop in Cross. So, you know, so people could wait at the coffee shop. And we tell the customer, hey, you, know, you don't have to uh, buy anything. But then we teach the people to sell whenever they're there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, you know, a lot of it is uh, just based on need, not because uh, we want to expand or have an empire. But uh, now we have products because uh, you know products available at uh, you know, some of the natural grocery stores, Buy Rights, um, Rainbow, and, and you know the, the Twitter building, and, and so forth. Uh, some in the Whole Foods. Uh, because everybody was asking, what can I buy, what can I buy? So we're, we're working towards that. I think pretty soon it will be available, uh, probably in about two months. So product is also just basically growth is based on need. Yep. And uh, I think you know, a lot of people do ask us to open here, there, here, and there. We just haven't done it. Let's give one more round of applause to our guests. Thank you.